Laboratory courses are a vital aspect of any undergraduate scientific experience. They offer students the opportunity to learn proper laboratory technique while developing effective observational and deductive reasoning skills. To maximize the learning potential for all the students in a laboratory course, it's important to recognize that a unique set of conditions and hazards are inherent to the laboratory environment. This training will review many of those hazards, as well as basic ways to minimize the associated risks so that laboratory work is a safe and rewarding experience for all involved. One of the most basic elements of lab safety should be considered before even arriving to lab. That basic element is a tire. Because even the most simplistic chemistry labs will involve chemicals and various types of glassware, loose clothing like scarves and flared sleeves are likely to knock flasks over and become contaminated with chemicals. Jewelry like bracelets and long necklaces can pose a similar hazard. For these reasons, loose-fitting clothing and jewelry should not be worn to lab, and long hair must be secured. It is also important to have shoes that completely cover the foot. Strong acids and bases are staples in chemistry. When they are dropped or knocked from the bench top, cuts to the feet and ankles, as well as chemical burns, are a likely result. Sandals and open-toed shoes are forbidden in the laboratory. In addition to ensuring appropriate attire in advance of lab, it is important to come prepared. Most instructors assign pre-laboratory work, which must be completed prior to lab. This work typically includes thoroughly reading all background information, as well as the procedure itself, providing written answers to pre-lab questions, performing relevant calculations, and knowing what materials and chemicals are to be used, as well as their associated hazards. Much of this information, including safety information, is provided in the laboratory workbook. However, there are other resources available to supplement the safety information provided in the workbook. Students who are thoroughly prepared for lab work more efficiently, have a better understanding of the concepts, and minimize the safety risks to themselves and their classmates. It's important that students understand the hazards of the chemicals with which they will be working. In addition to the safety rules and safety precautions provided in the laboratory workbook, labels and material safety data sheets, abbreviated MSDS, provide additional chemical-specific safety and health information. In the chemistry building, material safety data sheets for all of the chemicals are available in room 1362 and should be consulted prior to lab if there are any questions regarding the safe handling of chemicals to be used during lab. Before expanding on specific equipment that will be used during lab, there are a couple of absolute do's and don'ts that must be observed. Always wear ANSI-approved safety glasses or goggles. If you wear prescription glasses, goggles or over-the-glass glasses must also be worn. Do not eat or drink anything in lab. This rule applies to both food and chemicals. While most students aren't prone to sampling lab chemicals, there is a risk of chemical ingestion when food is brought to lab and becomes contaminated with chemicals from the bench top or even your hands. Do not smoke in the lab or anywhere in the physics and chemistry building since it is a smoke-free facility. Do not touch chemicals. Many chemicals can be absorbed through the skin or cause burns. Wear gloves if there is a potential for skin contact, and if contact occurs, flush the area with large quantities of cool water. Do not directly smell any chemical. On rare occasions, if instructed to do so, a chemical smell can be evaluated by wafting some vapors with a cupped hand. Always wash your hands before leaving lab. There are specific types of glassware and equipment that will be encountered on a fairly routine basis when working in the laboratory. It is important to be familiar with their function and proper handling. 
Glassware like beakers, Erlenmeyers, burettes, pipettes, graduated cylinders, and test tubes are synonymous with a laboratory environment. Beakers and Erlenmeyers are frequently used when performing titrations. Beakers may be more suitable when a magnetic stir plate is also used, and Erlenmeyers with their narrow necks offer more control and less risk of splashing during manual swirling. Burettes are used to deliver precisely measured and controlled amounts of titrant. Adjust the burette in the burette stand to ensure it is read at eye level, and record the value at the bottom of the meniscus. When a volume is to be measured but a high degree of accuracy is not required, a graduated cylinder is suitable for this task. When more accuracy is needed, volumetric or graduated pipettes should be used instead. Similarly, when precise concentrations of solution must be prepared, volumetric flasks should be used. In addition to reading the volume at the bottom of the meniscus, there are a couple of other aspects of using a burette that are equally important to ensure the integrity of your results. Before filling the burette, check that the stopcock is snugly tightened. After filling, drain some titrant through the tip and check for air bubbles and leaks. Finally, wipe the tip of the burette before obtaining your initial reading. As previously mentioned, pipettes are the preferred way of administering a given volume when accuracy beyond that of a graduated cylinder is required. When filling a pipette, pull the liquid up in the glass beyond the graduated mark and then, while holding a forefinger over the top, slowly drain the liquid until the meniscus touches the line. There are a variety of suction devices that can be used to pull the liquid into the pipette. However, under no circumstances should you ever pipette by mouth. One of the greatest hazards in the laboratory is broken glassware. Never use cracked or broken glassware in an experiment. Even a flask that has a small star in it could completely break when heated. Give the broken item to your instructor so that another one can be obtained. If glassware is dropped or knocked off the bench and broken, do not clean it up with your hands. Notify your instructor or the teaching assistant so that it can be cleaned up with a broom and dustpan. Even if the glassware has been broken in the sink, always clean it up using a broom and dustpan. Broken glass should never be disposed of down the drain or in the regular trash. It must be placed in the plastic lined cardboard box labeled Broken Glass Receptacle. There is a broken glass box maintained in every lab. In addition to standard types of glassware, there are also some standard types of laboratory equipment, including balances, hot plates, pH meters, stir plates, Bunsen burners, thermometers, and fume hoods. For electrical lab equipment, like hot plates, stir plates, and balances, it is important to pay attention to the integrity of the electrical cords and keep them out of sinks and away from DI water stations. If the insulation on an electrical cord appears worn or frayed, do not use the device. Give it to your instructor so that a replacement can be obtained. Also, it is possible to have combination stir plates and hot plates. Be careful to pay attention to which knob is which and that you've turned on the function that you intended. The integrity of the electrical cords for all types of electrical equipment is important. Typically, balances are positioned in a designated area and are not routinely moved or relocated, so their electrical cords are not subjected to as much stress as other types of equipment. There are two primary classes of balances, two-place top-loading balances and four to five-place enclosed analytical balances. With either type, the pan and electronics must be free from contamination of solid and liquid materials. If even small amounts of chemicals are spilled onto the balance, they must be thoroughly cleaned up immediately to prevent damage to the sensitive balance components. Also, when weighing material or obtaining tear weights, Residual contamination can lead to erroneous values.
Solid material can be swept up using an appropriate brush, and liquid should be cleaned using chem wipes or damp paper towels. Ensure that the balances are clean before use and are left clean when lab is complete. The chemical fume hood is another staple in the laboratory environment. When volatile solvents and concentrated acids like hydrochloric are used, they will oftentimes be dispensed in a chemical fume hood. The sole purpose of the chemical fume hood is to prevent chemical gases and vapors from entering the room. There is a fan pulling air at a minimum velocity through the open sash and exhausting the gases and vapors outside the building. When using a fume hood, chemicals must be handled at least six inches inside the hood space, and the sash should be maintained as low as possible for the work being performed. Fume hoods are intended for pouring, dispensing, and general handling of chemicals. They should not become storage areas or repositories for unclaimed waste. Such activity reduces the usable workspace and prevents the hood ventilation from working properly. In addition to standard glassware and equipment, there are standard types of chemicals that are likely to be encountered in most every lab. These include acids, bases, and solvents, each with their own hazards and handling precautions. Regardless of the chemical, there are a couple of rules that should always be followed. First, never engage in horseplay. You risk causing an accident. Never heat a closed system. You risk an explosion hazard. Never put chemicals back into the original container. You risk contamination. Never conduct unauthorized experiments. And finally, never work in the laboratory alone. There are a variety of acids that are likely to be encountered in lab, including acetic acid, hydrochloric acid, and sulfuric acid, to name a few. The characteristics they all have in common is a pH less than 7 and the potential to cause burns to unprotected skin. Also, many experiments will require that strong acids be diluted in water. There is a very precise way this dilution must occur. Always slowly add acid to water by pouring it down inside the flask or down a glass stirring rod. Never add water to acid. When acid and water are combined, heat is generated. If the water is poured into the acid, the heat is unable to dissipate throughout the solution and can cause the acid to splash. In addition to acid damaging skin, it can also damage clothing, notebooks, backpacks, or anything else it comes in contact with. For these reasons, good laboratory hygiene is essential. Keep the lab benches clean and walkways clear of personal belongings. There are also many bases used in lab. Strong bases can exist either in solutions or solids. Unlike acids, by definition their pH is above 7. However, similar to acids, they can burn and blister unprotected skin, damage clothing and other materials, and should be added to water not the other way around. When dissolving solid hydroxide bases in water, the container will become very hot. Make sure such procedures are carried out in suitable glass containers. If the container must be moved or touched, do so only with suitable gloves. In addition to chemical burns, a thermal burn from contact with the container is also possible. Solvents generally do not share properties with acids and bases. The predominant hazards affiliated with solvents include flammability and the ability to defat unprotected skin. Open handling of large volumes of solvents or other volatile chemicals should always be conducted in a fume hood, away from any potential ignition sources. Flammable chemicals should be stored in an approved flame cabinet when not in use. Despite the highest degree of care and preparedness, occasionally unforeseen situations will occur during lab. It is important to know how to respond if an accident or incident occurs. If you experience a cut or if chemicals splash onto your skin or into your eyes, water is your best friend. 
For minor cuts or skin contact with chemicals, first report the incident to your instructor and then flush the affected area under running water for 15 minutes. Similarly, if chemicals or foreign debris get into your eyes, notify the instructor, then flush your eyes for 15 minutes at an eye wash station. There are eye wash stations mounted on the wall near the safety shower. There are also drench hoses at the sink, which are able to effectively flush the eyes. If corrosive chemicals are spilled onto your clothes or over a large portion of your body, immediately use the safety shower while removing the contaminated clothes. Safety showers will provide 20 gallons of water per minute for at least 15 minutes and should not be pulled as a joke or prank. However, if needed, do not hesitate to use them. In all situations, if symptoms persist or worsen, seek medical attention. If immediate medical assistance is required, notify campus police by calling extension 6911. If a spill occurs in lab, the first thing to do is notify the instructor. Some spills can be easily cleaned up with paper towels, but others may need a universal absorbent like vermiculite or an absorbent specific to the type of chemical, depending on whether it is an acid, base, or solvent. The absorbent material soaks up the liquid, and then the solid can be collected with a dustpan and broom. Regardless of the materials used to clean up the spill, they should not be put into the regular trash. Consult the instructor on the proper disposal method. If the spill is too large or insufficient absorbent media is available, the spill should be reported by calling extension 6911. Although rare, laboratory fires do occur. Small fires, isolated to a single flask, can be smothered by placing a watch glass over the flask. Fires on the bench top, or fires involving more than one flask, can be extinguished by smothering with sand or using a fire extinguisher that is located in the hallway outside the laboratory. However, fire extinguishers should only be used if the individual has been trained, has a clear means of egress, and feels comfortable doing so. Otherwise, the best course of action is to evacuate the lab, pull the evacuation alarm as you exit the building, and call extension 6911 from a safe location. If an evacuation is required, either as a result of an incident within the lab or elsewhere in the building, bring all experiments to a safe state. Turn off all electrical equipment and quickly walk out of the lab. The last person should pull the door shut behind them. Proceed out of the building using the nearest exit. Once outside, remain with your lab group so the instructor can ensure everyone is accounted for. During an evacuation, always use the stairs. Never take the elevator. Laboratories are unique environments with their own unique set of hazards. Understanding the basic function of laboratory equipment, glassware, chemicals, and the corresponding hazards provides the fundamental knowledge base for conducting lab work. With this knowledge base and thorough pre-lab preparations, Chemistry Laboratory can be a memorable and rewarding experience for everyone. Now test your basic laboratory knowledge with a short quiz. A passing grade is 80% or higher.